Welcome to Red Rocks Austin, where we value authenticity. Now we say that a lot. Here's what we usually mean by it. The easiest way for me to practice being authentic is to tell you about all the things I'm really bad at. Let me show you. I am incredibly unorganized. If you saw my desktop right now, you'd probably go to a different church. I have thousands of unopened emails in my inbox and none of them are important. I think. <laughs> I have a fairly low social capacity, and so I love people, but I also get tired very quickly, and when I get tired, sometimes I start acting and saying things that are not Jesus-like. I tend to avoid confrontation and conflict. I tend to always think that everybody's mad at me all the time for everything, and so instead of embracing the conflict and enjoying the deeper connection and contentment on the other side of it, I just avoid it altogether. All things I'm working on, but things that I'm not good at. I say all that to say this. That's really easy for me to say. You know what's not easy for me to say? That God created me to write. That I just love it. I do it every day. I'm never not outlining books in my head. And after 10 years of very mediocre writing, I feel like I've finally created something that's different. That's on another level. That's new. That's fresh. That's needed. That's going to help thousands of people learn how to be content today. That line is equally authentic. It's just that for whatever reason, it's easier for me to talk about my weaknesses than my strengths. But Ethan and Doug told me to get over myself this week. And so welcome to Red Rocks. This sermon is four years in the making. And it is called Single Today. Now, I've done this long enough to know I just lost a bunch of you who see that first word and they go, well, today's not for me. I'm not single. Let me press. This book and this sermon is about that first word, but it's also about that second word. Anybody ever struggle to be present today because of shame from the past or worry about the future? If you could put a pie chart of what we give our attention to, I feel like it's this. We're here today, and yet things from yesterday pull us back, and worry about tomorrow keeps us from being present today. Meanwhile, we read things like Jesus saying, don't worry about tomorrow, as he called people to live on purpose today, and it almost feels like a foreign language to us. So what I want to do with this whole project is help people learn how to, to let go of yesterday and surrender tomorrow and live on purpose today. That's not just a single person problem, that's a people problem. Number, reason number two why this book is also for you is because singleness is a lot bigger of a subject than I think we realize. I, when I describe this book to people, oftentimes they'll go, that's going to be so great for young adult ministries. Now, that's true. It is going to be really helpful for young adult ministries. But the truth is everyone is single at some point. Like, yes, it's the young adult looking for a date, but what about the widow waking up in her bed for the first time by herself in decades? What about the middle-aged man that gets blindsided by divorce? See, everyone is single at some point. Depending on the studies that you read, they usually put the number around 46% of U.S. adults being single. I'll prove it. Raise your hand if you're single. I'm kidding. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You can if you want. <laughs> you may not be single, but I bet you know someone who is. I bet you have a son or a daughter who is, a niece or a neighbor, a co-worker. And I bet you, if you've tried to talk to them about their singleness, there's a fair chance you got met with some resistance because it can be a sensitive subject. So I want to teach you how to speak to us. I, I, I want, as someone who's been single my entire life, let me help you. So get a book for yourself. Also get a book for your single friend and say, hey, I haven't been single in a decade, but I would love to read this together and hear your thoughts on it because conversation is how we move forward. All that to say, this sermon and this book is for everyone. So we're going to learn how to be single Today. Now, to sum up this entire sermon in one verse, I would go Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, where the writer of Hebrews says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. That's what we are here to do. Run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Now let's reverse engineer this verse. Let's start with the second part and then we'll talk about the first part. What is the race marked out for us? 
Because Vision Casting 101 says that you have to know where you're going in order to get there. If you don't have a vision, if you don't know what the finish line of the race is, it doesn't matter how hard you work, you're not going to get there. You're going to head in a different direction. And so what is our finish line? Let me make four statements, all of them equally important and equally true. Statement number one, marriage is God's idea and it is a beautiful gift. Sometimes I worry that since I'm the guy that's talking about singleness so much that people will think I'm against marriage. Nothing could be further from the truth. The second page of scripture, it says, it's not good for man to be alone. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one. Marriage is a beautiful gift from God. I've been praying that single today, a book about singleness, will push more and more people to get married. That's truth number one. Truth number two, Red Rocks Church is a great place for you to meet somebody with similar values. Similar, who's living on, on the same mission. And we want that for you. Like, I, 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 I want that for you. Which brings me to truth number three. I pray for that to happen for you. Every morning, I, I pray that, that relationships would be started in this lobby. And so to recap, number one, marriage is God's idea. Number two, Red Rocks is a great place to meet people. Number three, we genuinely want that for you. Number four... We don't exist as a church to make Red Rocks more married. We exist to make heaven more crowded. That's our finish line. And we have to start there, and I say that in love, and here's why. Because everybody worships something. Everybody has a finish line that they're running after. Everybody makes something an ultimate thing in their life. And when you make a future spouse that finish line for you, then you've just guaranteed that that future husband or wife will let you down on repeat. And all the married couples just said amen. Hey, and that's not a shot at your future spouse. It's an invitation to you to stop putting a pressure on their shoulders that they were never created to carry. Marriage is not the finish line. We exist as a church to make heaven more crowded. And when you get that, when you start to really get that what meaning, when you show up to Red Rocks going, I'm here to make heaven more crowded, and you're running that race set out for us, hey, you may notice along the way that someone to your left or right is running the same race, and that you two make a very good team, and that you can help make heaven more crowded better together and run this race with more perseverance together than you can apart. And when that happens, what a beautiful thing that we celebrate all the time. Oh, but we got to get the order right. We have to, I'm, I'm passionate about it because for decades, one of the reasons I, I wrote the book is because for decades, uh, I've, I've watched the church let finding a future spouse be the finish line for so many people, only to get there and then wonder why their for, first year of marriage is so difficult. When we get the order right, when we realize this race set out before us is to make heaven more crowded then it frees us up to live on purpose today to help people know God, find purpose, live on purpose, and go change the world together. So, the end of Hebrews 1, 12, 1, that's the finish line that we're running towards. But remember the first thing the writer said, therefore, throw off the everything, like all of the weight that so easily weighs us down, the sin that so easily entangles in other words, it's like we're running the, this race today, and yet we have all this stuff from the past that's just weighing us down, making us feel so heavy. And, and as I sat down to write this sermon, I wrote 27 different sermons for this weekend. So I'm like, I've, how do I take a project I've worked on for four years and boil it down to 30 minutes? And, and finally, I was like, I'm just going to do part one of part one of the book. We won't even get to tomorrow. We won't even get to all of the, the worry and the surrender and, and all of that. We'll just get to part of part one and talk about how we can let go of some of the stuff from yesterday that keeps us from running our race on purpose today. And so to illustrate this, this is Single Sam. Everyone say hi to Single Sam. Single Sam knows that Single Sam has a race marked out for Single Sam. God has a plan and a purpose for Single Sam. And so today, Single Sam walks out of Single Sam's front door, feeling great, ready to go encourage and, and, and love and pray for and have fun and enjoy the full abundant life God has for Single Sam today. The problem is, 
single Sam is a human. Not really. Single Sam is, in fact, a stick figure. And by the way, if your name is Sam, that is a coincidence. I promise I needed a one-syllable name that started with S. <laughs> For the sake of the analogy, imagine Single Sam is a real person. That means that today, Single Sam is not a blank slate. Single Sam has a yesterday. And as we all know, those yesterdays are filled with lots of stuff, like regrets. See, Single Sam hasn't batted a 1,000. Single Sam's made a few mistakes along the way, and so Single Sam will be walking down the street today, and all of a sudden, a memory from yesterday will pop into Single Sam's mind, and Single Sam will, will go, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. Single Sam's also been through some pain, so Single Sam has some grudges. Single Sam got broken up with a year ago. Single Sam got rejected two years ago. Now Single Sam gives so much of Single Sam's energy to, to thinking, how am I going to get back at that person? I'm going to show them. And so trying to be present today, live a full abundant life today, and yet can't stop thinking about grudges from yesterday. And then, of course, beneath all of that is always shame. There's shame from yesterday, lies from the enemy, whispering to Single Sam, not just that the thing that Single Sam did was wrong, but that Single Sam is wrong. And so Single Sam has all this shame from yesterday. And now this race marked out for Single Sam, that Single Sam is trying to run with perseverance, is getting heavier and heavier and heavier by the day. And so what does single Sam need to do? Single Sam needs to turn and face back to yesterday and learn how to heal the stuff from the past. Single Sam needs a little spring cleaning for the soul. So that's what I, I want to do today. Uh, I, it's springtime. And just if we can pause for a second, do some spring cleaning in your home. Get rid of some stuff that doesn't need to be there. This is just what we do. We accumulate things over time. We don't mean to, but it happens, and it feels so good to get rid of those things. My parents were in town for Easter a few weeks ago, and we were having breakfast, and I said, hey, would you guys, would you just come over to my townhome? I've been there for six years. I, I try to live pretty minimally, and yet I still accumulate things over time because I'm human. Would you just walk through with me? Because sometimes it's helpful to have somebody else walk with you. And let's just go, like, keep, throw away, donate. Keep, throw away, donate. And we did. And it was so refreshing, just a little spring cleaning. Solomon, one of the wisest humans to ever live, wrote a lot of really wise things. But in Ecclesiastes 3.6, one of the wisest is this. There is a time to keep and a time to throw away. I don't know who this is for, but that case that your old iPhone came in. <laughs> I know the box is sleek. Probably get rid of it. I'm the last person that should give interior design advice, but I am good at soul care. And, and, and so let's take that same analogy that we gather a whole bunch of junk from yesterday and let's do what my parents did for me, walk through together and take some inventory of our past, starting with regrets. Anybody ever said anything or done anything that they regret? Anybody ever tried to tell a joke and then get to the punchline and realize nobody laughed? And instead of just owning it, you just keep talking and talking and talking. Meanwhile, in the back of your mind, you're searching for another punchline. I think one of the reasons I like to, to write so much is because you can type and you can work on a paragraph. And then you can realize, like, that's not it. And then it's just command Z, command Z, command Z, command Z. And you're good. Man, I wish we had command Z in life. I, I wish we could just go, I'm going to back up. Let's back up five seconds. I'm going to make that joke different this time. I'm going to not say that thing that I just said. I'm going to not do that thing that I just did. Regrets are a part of life. And this is true for all people, but especially for single people. Every single, single person I've ever met with ha has regrets from their past. Like the ones that got away. You know that one I'm talking about? That one you had feelings for? And there was like a, a window that opened up, an opportunity, but you didn't shoot your shot for whatever reason. And then that person started dating somebody else. And then a year later, you're scrolling through your feed, and that person is posting a picture of her engagement to that somebody else. And you're just sitting there going, no, the window is closed. And then you look at the guy, and you're like, and him? Seriously? She ended up with him? Are you kidding me? That dude better have, like, the world's best personality. <laughs> you know, you start, like, judging him. <laughs> Regrets from the past are real. Or, or maybe it was a date that you did get to go on, and yet you didn't bring your A game. 
And, and now you can't stop overthinking that night. Like, I was too quiet. I was too talkative. And why did I wear that shirt? You know, <laughs> like regrets from yesterday. And these are pretty surface level regrets, but we could get heavy in a hurry. You have a great relationship going, and then one night of bad decisions, and you throw it all away, and you can't stop thinking about it. You're trying to be present today and run the race God has for you today, but regrets from the past keep pulling you back. Let me encourage you for a second. There's somebody else in, uh, who, who has a lot of regrets. His name's the Apostle Paul. He's one of the heroes of the faith planted churches all over the known world, took took the gospel to the ends of the earth, wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. And by the way, as an aside, did it all as a single person, which is weird because I thought you had to be married to begin your ministry. So I don't know if those like those books really count. Sorry, the whole thing I'm working through. (laughs) Paul is a hero of the faith. Oh, but Paul has a past. Before Paul was Paul, his name was Saul, and he was persecuting the church. Acts 8, verse 3. Look at this language. But Saul, who becomes Paul, began to destroy. I love the verb that that Luke picks. Destroy the church. He wasn't just writing mean things on Instagram about the church. He was literally destroying, like real persecution. Destroying the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Drag them off and put them in prison. And then in the very next chapter, Paul gets radically saved. And God forgives him of all of it. But here's the truth. God's a lot better at forgiving than people are. Have you noticed? And so Paul gets saved and he goes, okay, now the race that I want to run with perseverance is to make heaven more crowded and build the church. But like imagine Paul's first day on the job. Anybody had, ever had a tough first day on the job? Paul's was worse. Paul walks in and goes, hey, I'm Paul. And everyone goes, yeah, no, we know who you are. You're the reason my brother is in prison. You dragged my mom and my dad off to jail. And so don't, hey, I'm Paul, me. We're not cool, just so you know. Like, imagine how often Paul had to deal with regrets from the past. Anybody ever been a part of the same church as their ex? It'd be hard. Even if both of you want the same thing, even if both of you wanted to to be civil and want to just just be on mission, it can be uncomfortable. Why? Because regrets are a real thing. Just know that Paul experienced those same regrets. And I say all that to say this. These words we're about to read that Paul wrote in Philippians 3 verse 13 were hard fought for words. We can trust them. This is what Paul writes. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, Paul goes, this is, this is the one thing I'm good at. To which I go, there's lots of things, Paul, you were good at. And he goes, no, this, is, this is it. This is what I knew how to do really well. But the one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul goes, the one thing I know how to do is anytime I feel those regrets start to to come back up to the surface, to go, that's not who I am anymore. I put the past behind me. I I dealt with that. I invited God into that. I allowed the Holy Spirit to heal that. And I don't got time to walk around carrying all those regrets from the past because I've got too much work to do in the present. Paul knew how to live fully alive today. Not because he had a perfect track record, because he understood the gospel. He, when you read his writings, all, like there's thousands of verses I could have chosen for, for this, but let's go 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Hey, if you struggle with regret from the past at all, I just need you to memorize 2 Corinthians 5, 17 this week. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. New person. New person. New person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. If anybody has the credit to write that and the authority to write that, it's Paul. And he's going, that's true about each one of you who put their faith in Jesus. You've become a new person. 
The old is gone. The new has come. Now, we also have an enemy who loves to whisper in our ear that that's not true. So here's what we have to learn how to do. We have to learn how to fight back on repeat. But let me give you what I want to do today is give you three of these screens. It's today's truth and today's declaration. You want to learn how to live a full, abundant life today? You take these three truths and you memorize them. You take these three declarations and you preach them to yourself on repeat. You are the most important preacher in your life. You know that? Doug's pretty good. You're more important. You talk to yourself more than Doug talks to you. So you preach this sermon to yourself on repeat. I am a new person. I am a new person. I am a new person. Not my words. Straight from 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Straight from God's word. I am a new person. The old is gone. The new has come. Hey, and when the enemy tries to whisper in your ear and remind you about your past, you remind the enemy about his future, and then you live fully alive and on purpose today. You start to do that on repeat, and this is a daily discipline, by the way. People will come up to me in the, the lobby and go, hey, I hear what you say about regrets, and I tried that, but it didn't work. Like, that would be like going to a personal trainer and saying, I worked out, why am I not in shape? Because it's a daily discipline. It's practice every single day. But when you do that, you can actually be, to use Paul's other words, transformed by the renewing of your mind. I am a new person. I am a new person. I am a new person. So single Sam has a lot of regrets from single Sam's past. But single Sam learns how to preach this gospel truth to single Sam's self. And before you know it, those regrets from yesterday start to lose their power today. But there's some more. There's some, some more stuff from yesterday that's entangling us. And so let's talk about grudges. Love is risky. It is two imperfect people trusting one another with the most vulnerable, authentic version of themselves. And when it works, it's one of the most beautiful things in the world. When it doesn't, it leads to a lot of baggage and bitterness. It's painful. And when you don't take time to acknowledge that pain, when you don't take time to feel that pain, when you don't take time to talk to your friends, or talk to a counselor about that pain, when you don't take time to let God into that space, and you just sort of push it down, you're kind of like a gardener seeing a weed in the garden and going, oh, it'll be fine. Except then two days later, there's four of them. Oh, it'll be fine. Come back a few days later and it's completely overgrown. And with what, what every good gardener knows is you got to get to the root of the problem and get the bad stuff out. When you don't, grudges from yesterday will affect you today. And I don't care how much right now you're going, ah, no, 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 that's not true for me. I'm fine. I'm fine. It's fine. It's fine. General rule of thumb, the more you're doing that, like, I'll just, I'll pay attention to the point number three. The more you need point number two. Grudges from yesterday affect us today. Like, anybody notice how angry everybody's getting? I got onto the, the highway on 35 on Thursday morning, drive to, drive to the church, and then traffic was slow, like 15 to 20 miles. But I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to be here for a while. I'd probably just merge over to the left lane. Except that the guy in the big white pickup truck behind me apparently thought that he owned the left lane. Because I, I just merged, I was keeping up with traffic, but I just merged into his lane. And he starts flashing his brights and flipping me off. And flashing his brights and flipping me off. At first I thought he was saying, single today is going to be number one, man. And I said, thank you. I hope so too. Then I realized, like, this guy's really angry. For merging onto the highway. You know, like that thing he just did a few exits back. I was merging onto the highway. Can we all just swallow a pill together? Unless you own all of the highways in Austin, it's gonna hurt, but we're in this together. Unless you own all of the highways in Austin, you are the traffic. <laughs> you are the problem for somebody else, and so am I. We're all the problem together. We're all late for our meetings together. So can we all just exhale on the roads and breathe? And to the guy in the white pickup, sorry to make you the scapegoat of this illustration and nothing but love and grace for you. 
But hey, here's also some truth for you. You can heal from your past. Maybe the reason it's hard for you to drive like an adult today is because you have 10 grudges that you refuse to heal from from yesterday. And we all do this, so I'm not throwing stones. But I am saying I think this world would be a whole lot better if we would take some time to turn and face yesterday and be really honest about the fact that, hey, that thing hurt. Hey, I didn't like how that happened over there. I made some mistakes too, but also they did as well. And I've got some grudges. I've got some resentment that I'm holding on to here. Bitterness feels good. But I'll say it like this. You only think it, it feels good. You only think bitterness feels good because you forgot how good freedom actually feels. The Apostle Paul had every reason to hold on to grudges from the past. Go read his, his story. It's, it's cr- crazy. So much persecution, getting stoned half to death, getting thrown in prison, just hard. And that's not like 420 stoned half to death. That's like actually people picking up rocks and throwing them at you. (laughs) Paul had every reason to hold on to bitterness, and yet in Ephesians 4, he writes this. Get rid of all bitterness. We could just stop there for the rest of the day, work through those few words. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Hey, especially to the single person, we could do a whole segment here called Bad Dates, Breakups, and Bitterness. I know it can be a painful journey along the way, but all of that resentment from yesterday is not helping you today. Get rid of it. How do we do that? He tells us in the next verse, verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Here we go. Forgiving each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. How do we do this? Remember that Jesus went first. Jesus was so good at forgiving. I love um, John Mark Comer just wrote a great book called Practicing the Way. It's all about practicing the way of Jesus. Go read it. It's so important. It's so good. But practicing the way of Jesus has kind of become this this phrase that, that we're throwing around a lot in the church. And I'm all for it. As one of your pastors, there's nothing I want more than for you to practice the way of Jesus. I also worry sometimes that we just copy and paste that onto our lives and say things like, oh, just practice in the way of Jesus. It's like, okay, if that's true, then here's what you do. You forgive other people. (laughs) Feel that? It's hard. Very muffled clapping for forgiveness, usually. (laughs) Because you read that, and if you're just being real, you got to be like, well, I'm practicing like some of the ways of Jesus, you know? Like, how about this one? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Well, you know Jesus, always speaking in parables. (laughs) Not in Matthew 5, that's Sermon on the Mount. He's telling you, this is literally what I want you to do. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Do you know that bitterness is allergic to prayer? You start praying for someone, you start blessing someone, you watch how that bitterness just starts to melt away. It takes time, it's not easy, but you do it, and that bitterness begins to leave. Ryan, are you telling me to bless my ex? Yes. But that's not fair. I know. I'm not ready to do that. Okay. Puts you in good company with just about every other human who's ever lived. Just know the invitation's always on the table. This call of Jesus, hey, the the, the single today call, that's not for the faint of heart. It takes work. It, it, It takes effort. It takes doing things that feel very unfair in the moment. But if I can just challenge you, you only think bitterness feels good because you've forgotten how good freedom actually feels. And so our daily truth for us to memorize and our daily declaration, Ephesians 4, 4, 32, the verse we just read. And then the declaration is this. I am forgiven, I can forgive. I am forgiven, I can forgive. This, lest you think I'm throwing stones, is a part of a daily rhythm for me that I often try to avoid. I, different story for another day. Uh, went through something over the last few months, and, and for those months, I've held on to bitterness and resentment because of it. 
been like my, my, little, my little grudge that I, I wanted. And, and all week, every time I've gotten to this part of the sermon in my notes, I felt the Holy Spirit tap me on the shoulder. And all week I've gone, huh. not me. I want to hold on to this grudge. I want to hold on to this bitterness. Until, there's a true story. Until literally yesterday, I'm sitting in the coffee shop at 8 in the morning, sipping my Americano. And I get to this point and I go, ah, okay. And I just start breathing on the inhale. I am forgiven. I can forgive. I am forgiven. I can forgive. And the first three or four, I go, uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> Slowly but surely, you start to feel that bitterness melt away. Before you know it, I started blessing that person, praying, God, would you, would you your favor abound in their lives? Would you provide for them, surround them with love? Before you know it, I'm just crying in the coffee shop, and the barista's looking at me like, this guy again, what's this guy always doing here? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm sorry, but I don't care. It feels like freedom. By this week, by, by this moment next week, You could have worked through that bitterness from the past, from that thing that you went through. You could decide to put in this work every day and do it. And if you do that, I promise you, you'll walk in here feeling so much more alive and so much more free. Whoever's watching this online right now, ladies at the Lane Murray unit, you can do this work this week. So single Sam has a whole lot of grudges from single Sam's past, but a single Sam learn how to do this work and realize that that single Sam is forgiven so single Sam can forgive those grudges, start to lose their power, and single Sam starts to live alive and free today. Hey, but let's be real. There's one last one that we need to talk about, and it's really the one underneath the other, shame. Since the Garden of Eden, the enemy has been crafting this lie, not just that what we did was wrong, because that's probably true, but the lie is that makes you wrong. Shame is this lie that makes us feel like we are not enough. And I had a whole teaching I wanted to do at this point because I was going to bring us back to Hebrews 12.1 because Hebrews 12.2 says fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So how do we run the race with perseverance? How do we throw all this stuff off? We fix our eyes on Jesus. It says who, who, who went to the cross for us, scorning its shame. Like Jesus took that shame on his shoulders so that you can go free. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about how it's actually when he's weak that he's strong. And so now he just learns how to boast uh, about his weaknesses. And then yesterday I thought, I think I just need to boast about my weaknesses. That Jesus may be made beautiful. And I, so I just decided to end this by telling a story um, that was really one of the driving stories of the last four years of writing this book for me. Um, it's not in the book. It was just a motivator behind the book. Um, this book begins, chapter one, with the line, is there something wrong with me? I don't know if anyone's ever asked that question. That question reeks of shame. It's the enemy whispering in our ear that there's something wrong with us. And as the book begins, I'm sitting in a, a parking lot, an empty parking lot on a Sunday night, and I can't put my car in drive because I'm just at this point where I'm, I'm numb and I'm over it and I can't process anything and I feel like there's something wrong with me. I was young into to my ministry career um, and was getting a, a lot of great opportunities. There's also some, some hard things I was going through that I didn't have the tools to process, like having to lead very unfair funerals where you just go, what, what, are the, what is the answer here? There is no answer to this question that everybody is here asking. I was getting phone calls from, from parents who telling me about what their kids going through and just feeling like, I, I don't know how to process all this. Now, when that happens in life, there's two options. Option number one is to invite God into that space and to say, God, I have way more questions than answers. I don't know. This doesn't feel fair to me, but I know you're good, and I know you draw close in times of pain, and so I'm here. Would you be here and cry with me? That's, that's option number one. Option number two is just to try to medicate it, try to numb it try to push it down and pretend like it's not there. Now, I didn't have the wisdom for option one at the time, and so I would go to option two. I would try to medicate it. I I would try to push the pain down. Now, everybody has their drug of choice. For me, from a a young age, pornography was a thing that always seemed to to call me. 
I never wanted it in my life. Always saw it as a twisting of a beautiful gift of sex that, that God has created. Never wanted to go back to it and yet would. And never knew why I would keep going back. Because by the way, when shame is running the show, it keeps you from doing the deeper inner work that it takes to, to really break free from, from that stuff. There's a whole chapter uh, about that. Chapter 3 in, in the book is about my, my, my process of, of once we learn to outsmart the shame, we can start to see what's, what's really going on. But, but I didn't have that at the time. And, and so I would get caught in these shame spirals. And uh, what would usually happen is realize, I didn't realize at the time, but what I can realize now is I was always searching for validation. I was always hoping that I was enough. There wasn't something wrong with me. And so when times were good, when things were going well, when community was good, when ministry was good, I was fine. But it's when the critiques came, or it's when the, the, the pain came, or it's when the, the things I couldn't control came, that I would find myself being drawn back to it. Well, one week, I... Uh, had put together this, this course that was going to be uh, this, this online course for, for the church. It was going to help people understand the Bible better, and they could just do it online. And I was, I was so excited about it. It was kind of a, kind of a newer I- idea, and coming up with the content was, was so easy and so good for me, and, and recording it was so easy and so good. I just felt like I was running in my lane. And then came all the administrative work that it takes to actually make it go. And I just shut down. I tried so hard, but it was like, everybody needs a username, but I don't know how to get them a username. And then everyone needs a password, but I don't know how to get them a password. And everyone keeps forgetting their password. I don't know how to reset their password. And I keep losing their emails and my 10,000 emails in my inbox. And I'm trying hard right now, but I feel like I'm pushing a rock up a hill. And so in that week, I ended up relapsing. I'm going back to my drug of choice. And then I show up to church feeling like, the last person who should ever leave. The last, I felt like a, a hypocrite. And I had accountability partners, I had friends I was talking to, I was doing all of the steps and yet felt so unqualified. And I show up and that day, I'm leading this little uh, breakout thing where everybody comes with their questions. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'll teach you how to make a username, even though I have like no idea what I'm doing. And one by one, everybody's asking questions, and the whole time I'm there, I'm trying to be present today, but I can't stop thinking about yesterday. And if I'm being real, I just wanted to go home and go to sleep. I just wanted to be done. I'm thinking, I've missed my call. I, I shouldn't be in ministry. I'll just get into real estate or something. I don't know, right? Meanwhile, Sally's over there like, I can't remember my password. I'm like, I, this is not me. And I slowly work my way through everybody's questions, but there's a guy who's just sort of loitering right over there in the back. And I kind of see him out of the corner of my eye and work my way through everybody else's questions. And then, I'm not proud of this, but as I'm walking up to him, my prayer is literally, this is so bad, Lord, make this quick. Lord, make this quick. This is done, man. I walk up. I said, hey, man, what's, what's going on? And he said, my mom's been an atheist her whole life. She's on her deathbed. Never wanted to talk about God, but this week she started asking questions about God, and I don't know any of the answers, and I've never been to a church before, and I don't know what to say. Can you give me a few things to say to her? It felt like the Holy Spirit dumped a gallon of cold water on me. As if God was saying, hey, bud, you done feeling sorry for yourself for things from yesterday? Because I've got some kingdom work for you to do today. It's like I woke up. It's like, whoa. I go, hey, let me lock up real quick, and then I'm coming with you. And, and he, this is his first time in, in a church. I don't think he was, he was like, no, just give me a few, like, words to say, whatever. Like, no, we're doing this. We're going, we're going together. Come on. So I lock up. We drive to the house. It's this beautiful, like, gated community overlooking the ocean. And, and um, go to the house, this mansion, beautiful mansion, and I walk inside, and it's just lifeless. Huge mansion, and nobody's home. A couple of nurses. Son and me walk up to, to the suite, to her bedroom, and she's there propped up in her bed. And I go stand by her side with her son, and to the best of my imperfect ability, just start sharing the gospel. Start from Genesis. 
that God created us. He loves us. He's a plan and a purpose for our lives, and yet we break, we break that good plan that he has for us so often. We make so many mistakes. I make so many mistakes. It's one of those moments where I feel like I realize I'm preaching to myself as I'm, as I'm preaching to her. I get so much stuff from yesterday, and we get all this shame, but the amazing truth about the gospel is that in the greatest act of love of all time, Jesus came for us. God says that, that he took him who knew no sin to become sin, that we may become the righteousness of Christ, that we may have right standing with God. And as I'm saying all of that, the son interrupts, and he goes, I haven't been a great son. It's one of those moments, like, you know, Paul in the Transfiguration, where, where God is there, and Peter's like, and I, another thing I could say, and God's just like, shh, 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 shh. I feel like God does that to me. Like, Ryan, just be quiet. Just let this go. He goes, I've been holding on to a lot of grudges from stuff in the past. And that's pushed, that's caused me to, to, to stay distance away from you. And I'm very sorry about that. I don't want it to go that way. And she starts saying, I haven't been a great mom. I haven't been there for you. I'm sorry. And they're crying and I'm crying and the nurses are crying. They bring it back to the gospel and they go, hey, we want to pray this prayer. Can we pray this prayer? And they both receive Jesus into their heart. Get saved and that messes with your theology good let it let the radical grace of Jesus mess with you and then go read the story of the thief on the cross he goes hey I want to get baptized and I'm looking at I look at the nurses and they're just like like she's not leaving and so I go and I get a water from the sink and I come back over to the bed and we have a, a, a beautiful baptism moment there it's one of the most beautiful memorable ministry moments of my life and listen, I almost completely missed it because shame from yesterday was whispering in my ear that I'm not enough today. If there's any reason why I wrote this book over the last four years, it's this. I'm so tired of letting the enemy spin that lie. Your past doesn't disqualify you, church. It's the whole point of the gospel. I know that shame is real, but Jesus is ready to heal. And so as you're ready to face that shame and invite the spirit into that shame, just know that you are a new creation, that you can leave yesterday behind and live fully alive today. And so to end our time together, one last declaration. This comes from Paul, 2 Corinthians 12.10. Memorize it, man. I think Paul, when he was Saul, thought he had to be strong. But when Saul became Paul, he just knew it's his job just to be weak. When I'm weak, I'm strong. When I'm weak, I'm strong. That Sunday morning, I was very weak. And God's going, great, you're finally past yourself. Now you can be a vessel. Now let's go. It's the beauty of the gospel. He just uses broken and perfect people like me to go, okay, let's go. So what I thought would be fun is for us to end our time together by singing a song called Holy Forever. Because here's the, the truth about shame. It's so real today. It feels so real today. But when you learn to realize, to fix our eyes back on Jesus and realize that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he is holy forever, you start to see that shame dissipate. You start to see that shame lose its power over you. And when that starts to happen, you start to go free. And so single Sam has a lot of shame from yesterday. But as single Sam keeps preaching and declaring these truths over single Sam's life, that shame starts to leave. And single Sam starts to learn how to live alive and free today. That's what I want to see happen in the church. That's what I want to see happen for, for single people, for married people, for all people in the church. I keep, I keep doing all these interviews for the book, and the question that keeps coming up is, well, how can the church better serve single people? And it's getting to the point where it takes like all of my restraint, not to, not to, to say this too passionately, but I, I just sit there and I go, it's not how can the church better serve single people? It's how can single people better serve the church? 
It's how can married people better serve the church. It's how can engaged people better serve the church. It's getting our eyes back to Hebrews 12.1 and remembering what the real finish line really is. To make heaven more crowded at all costs. And whatever comes our way, we're just going to run our race. Getting rid of all the shame from the past and the grudges from the past and the resentment from the past. And hey, if you meet somebody along the way that's doing the same thing, we cheer you on in that. That's good and that's amazing. But let's make sure we get the order right, church. That's how we live fully alive today. Amen? You guys stand to your feet with me if you're able. I, uh, I wrote like 10 different endings for this thing. And then uh, I realized there's a, a blessing that I like to, to pray over single people and all people. I thought it would be fitting um, just to end today with this blessing. And so wherever this finds you today, you just close your eyes. You know, just put your hands out in front of you just in a posture of, of receiving. And so to the single person who feels insecure, may you be reminded that there isn't something wrong with you, that you aren't in a holding pattern, that today is the day the Lord has made and that you can rejoice in it. To the parent, the friend, or the loved one of the single person who is worried or wondering or wanting to get through, thank you. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for caring deeply about us. Thank you for continuing to invite us into your life and for loving us right where we are. We may be single, but because of you, we don't have to be alone. And so we say thank you, and may you be filled with a renewed strength and excitement to live fully alive today. To the single parent in the room, to the single parent listening online, to the single parent in overflow, may you be reminded right now in the name of Jesus that what you do matters, and may you receive an extra ounce of grace and strength today to get back into the game and to keep raising up the next generation. Now to the single person who feels lonely, who feels isolated, may you be reminded that you are not alone in your loneliness, that you are surrounded by millions of others who know how you feel, and that community is right there for you. And to everyone, single, dating, engaged, or married, who is struggling to be present today because of pain or shame from the past, may you be reminded that his mercy is new today that he bore your sins on the cross in the past so that you can go free in the present. Today is a new day, ripe with potential. May you find the strength to knock the dust off your feet from yesterday and be present to experience full, abundant, everlasting life today. In Jesus' name, church, let's worship the one who is holy forever.